So say we do have some mutations. Our repair mechanisms don't catch it. What happens next? So either the, uh, there's really three options. Either that change in the DNA turns out to be advantageous in some way. There's no particular um, change at all, or that change is deleterious and hurts the organism in some way. And so over time, over multiple generations, with a positive selection, you'll see that that comes to dominate the population. Uh, having that particular trait just turned out to be really good. So the, the whoever benefited from it had a higher fitness. Uh, neutral over time, like then the population kind of stayed the same. Uh, those individuals are incorporated, the genes are still being passed down, but there wasn't really a skew, either positive or negative. And then finally, in, if the change was actively bad, or that mutation was a problem, then it will disappear out of the gene pool after successive generations. Okay, so usually you see um, negative selection as opposed to purifying selection, but both kind of mean the same thing. Sorry, I have, I have help right now. Hold on. Okay, which brings us to these two guys, um, Salvador Luria on the right, okay, and Max Delbrook on the left, um, both of whom came to the U.S. in the early 1940s to do genetics work because what was happening in Europe during the late 1930s, oh, right, Hitler had just been elected to um, prime minister of Germany and was paving the way for all sorts of interesting reforms. Um, Max Delbruck's brother-in-law and brother were actually killed by the um, German uh, police state as, um, as they were involved in a plot to assassinate Hitler. So he had left um, and come to the U.S. and he was actually working at Coldbrook Laboratory. Uh, Luria had been working in Spain, but when Franco took over and instigated his fascist regime, he left Spain for France. Then when France got invaded, he left France on a bicycle to the port city of Marseille, where he was able to get a visa to come over to America. So much of our um, history of genetics is really tied in into what was going on during um, the early half of the 20th century, what wars were being fought in Europe, who was leaving, coming over here and getting funding. And meanwhile, American universities were pouring money into research in order to become really a front runner in science and technology research. So, okay, tiny tangent over, let's go. So what Lurie and Delbrook were looking at is whether or not mutations were occurring because something was happening to the organism, okay? At this point, back in the 40s, uh, the central dogma of biology really hadn't been hammered out. People didn't know what molecule was actively passing down genetic information. Was it proteins? Was it DNA? This stuff was only just starting to be um, uh, looked at and determined. And so they were looking at um, bacteria and viruses, kind of the easiest systems to work in. And the idea was, um, do mutations happen because they are needed? Or do mutations happen and then whatever environment that organism is uh, affects whether or not the organism survives? Okay, so what they so these are the two hypotheses that were going on. Um, Either that uh, bacteria was like just giving itself adaptive immunity. You would inoculate your cultures, let them grow for a bit, and then plate them out, and you would see just sort of a spread. There'd be a few mutations and everything sort of all the time, like mutations just uh, were clearly um, occurring because they needed to be there. Or the random mutation hypothesis in that mutations just, it's random. Uh, it may occur somewhere, it may not occur somewhere else, and you're gonna get this really interesting high variance in your plates um, when you look at it later. So what this test showed is that mutations don't happen for a reason, that they are just random changes, okay? So if you have one big batch culture, um, you get a lot of cells that uh, eventually are resistant and you expose them to this virus and basically all the plates have similar numbers of resistant cells. Okay, cool. Now, if we do that again, multiple times, okay, in like four different flasks, the uh, point at which that resistance just randomly happens is different in every culture. And this one, it happened very early, so we're gonna get a lot of resistant cells. This one, it didn't happen at all. We don't have any resistant cells. And these guys, maybe they showed up later in the growth cycle, so we have fewer uh, resistant cells, but different, when you plated it out, after you expose them to the virus, different plates have really, really different rates of resistance showing that these mutations happened 
at different times in different batches and it was random and there was no particular like need associated with it. Uh, it's just uh, something that popped up in your culture. So here's their data and what they're showing is that uh, for that one single batch culture, the number of resistant colonies was very similar over time. Okay, Over here where they did the culture numbers separately, they got in some cases nothing and then all the way up to 107. They had a very high variance in the in the separate cultures as opposed to the batch cultures. Okay, and that's when their their main conclusion being that no, this is really must be random. Okay. This is not likely to have happened um, and so therefore it has a uh, random uh, start. Okay. Next, how to infer evolutionary history through sequence changes. So something we're going to talk about a lot here is phylogeny, and that's the evolutionary history of a species or group. It's phylogeny. And so people have been doing this for a long time, trying to figure out what was related to what. Uh, here's uh, Darwin's famous tree, the idea that there was something, and then it branched off and branched off again and branched. And that's sort of the, the basis for uh, phylogeny, really. What came when, what was a precursor to what, and uh, what traits have changed over time. Okay, so here's an example of a phylogenetic tree, some terminology. We have the root at the base of the tree. Uh, trees can either be rooted or unrooted, but in most cases we're going to have some sort of root, a single common ancestor for everything that's on this tree. We've got our branches that are leading out to um, the terminal nodes at the end. Usually these are like a species, could be something like a genus. That we're leading out to the end and then we have our internal nodes wherever there's a major shift or break in the lineage okay. so the internal nodes could be rotated both of these trees are correct okay it's just that this node instead of having our human in the middle with the chimpanzee and the bonobo on top it's flipped so the bonobo and the chimpanzee are in the middle and the humans on top very human-centric point of view right but both of these are correct so if we want to talk about groups of um, nodes here, we've got a couple of ways to do it. Monophyletic is the easiest in that all of the groups that are contained in this green shading here contain a common ancestor. So a monophyletic group, everybody's there and everybody has a common ancestor. The next easiest one to explain is paraphyletic. They're kind of all in parallel. Uh, it doesn't contain every member. This one is left out, but it contains these two and it contains a common ancestor for those in the group. In a polyphyletic group, there is no common ancestor. So this one branches off, this one stops here, this one stops here. I mean, eventually you get a common ancestor here, but this one's left out, so that makes it not a paraphyletic group. So this is a polyphyletic. There is no uh, branch at the bottom that contains all of them, or internal node that links to all the branches. So you can have different styles here. Uh, we have on the left here is a cladogram where the branches are showing traits and nodes and things, but they're not um, to scale. Okay. In B, we're showing. Okay. So these are just showing different styles. They're all showing the exact same tree data, but just in a different way. We have a V-shaped tree on the left, we have a bracketed tree in the middle, and a radial branch tree on the right. So some of these are easier to read than others, and it's just a matter of style. Okay. Now we have different types of trees instead of style. We have our cladogram, doesn't give us any information on how related those particular groups are, just that where the common ancestors are for each group. A phylogram or a phylogenetic tree will have branch lengths that determine or show uh, how, how much evolutionary difference there are between the groups. For example, um, how A here is a shorter branch compared to E. E is much more um, genetically distant uh, because of the length here. And then finally, we have these uh, the dendrogram, which is also shows the, the um, difference in DNA or difference in relatedness, like the phylogram, but it makes all the puts all the terminal nodes on the same on the same line, so it's a little easier to parse through. It's also known as a ultrameric uh, tree. So how do we make these phylogenetic trees to start with? So now that we've got a lot of genetic data, what we can do is compare DNA sequences uh, between 
different organisms, okay? There's a couple ways to do that. The first is the unweight pair group with an arithmetic mean, which basically you just count how many bases are different between the sequences, assign them a number, build a matrix, and say, okay, well, if these have fewer changes, then they must be closer, more closely related. The next version is neighbor joining, where you sort of pinch off each of the pairs of sequences that, where the sequences are most similar, and then that keeps pinching them off and pairing them to try and make the shortest tree possible. And finally, parsimony, which is probably the best method, but the most computationally intensive, okay, where it goes nucleotide by nucleotide down the sequences, looks for what the possible structure could be, and then after it's done all that, it'll pick a tree that has the least number of changes from every possible configuration. So that takes a while. Uh, if you're looking at, you know, five sequences, you're up to, if you want to unroot a tree, 15 possible uh, trees, and if you're with rooted, 105, and if you're up to 10 sequences, you're looking in the millions of possible trees. So you have to use like a supercomputer or a cluster or something to use a uh, parsimonious method, but luckily that's why uh, cloud computing has really taken off, and so it's possible to do these comparisons in a reasonable amount of time. So here's the pretty much how we know the tree of life um, is. This is um, a phylogenetic tree here because the length of the, the lines do in fact mean something. Turns out that um, eukaryotes are most closely related to archaea, not to bacteria. For a long time, bacteria and uh, archaea were linked together, but um, with more genetic analysis, it's found that they're in fact much more similar to single cell eukaryotes and such. And here's a more detailed phylogenetic tree on page 183 of your book of the whole genome sequencing results for the uh, tree of life here. Um, and you can see archaea and eukaryotes are really grouped closely together and down in the bottom here. And they do share a lot of similarities in a lot of cellular processes and, and uh, basic protein structure and stuff. Okay.